coming up on TPI. I, I'm not good enough to be a mother. I'm turning into my mom. I was thinking, I'm losing my mind. I'm going to end up losing my daughter. My mind was spiraling just that fast. I was like, I'm losing it. Like, I can't get it together. Well, hello and welcome to TPI. I'm your host, Muiwa. I'm so happy you decided to join me today. TPI is celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. We've been able to reach this milestone because of viewers like you who tune in every week. It's our prayer that by the end of each program, your life is changed for the better. Now, if you've been blessed by TPI, please let us know. You can drop us a message on Facebook or Instagram. We always love to hear from you. Kicking things off, R&B singer Kenny Latimore and his wife, TV judge Faith Jenkins. They share their long and tumultuous road that brought them together. They offer an encouragement to single women through Faith's book, Sis, Don't Settle. While Kenny shares how to find hope and restoration and love after divorce. Entertainment reporter Ephraim Graham brings us their story. Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Faith Jenkins presiding. She's an attorney and the judge on TV's divorce court. No, she we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. You not, you not might as well do anything. Spend a lot of time, no, I can't deny this pressure. He's R&B's prince of the love song. Spend a lot of time, and I can't deny it's pressure. With yet another project climbing the charts. We, we often joke because Kenny has been singing love songs for the past 25 years. I host a show called Divorce Court. <laughs> I know. So he, he brings people together and I tear them right apart. <laughs> Faith Jenkins and Kenny Lattimore laugh often, sharing their love story and their journey to marriage. You two married almost two years and you you marry, and not only do you marry, but then you guys marry and the world shuts down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was, the, what was the, the Lattimore household like? What was it like? <laughs> wow. It was, a, it was a beautiful thing. One, on the music side, I would say, Faith became the muse and the, the inspiration behind all of the lyrics that were on the album. I wasn't really going to do a contemporary album. I was going to do a Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole project. That was really my goal. I thought it was an interesting time because I got to know Faith in a different way. We laugh at the whole quarantine thing in respect that the time that we were able to spend together in quarantine may equal five years <laughs> compared to what I would have normally been able to spend with her because of my travel schedule and all that. I would have been in and out of visiting her at divorce court and all that, but I would have been on the road. But it was like God said, no, nope, you're gonna stop. The whole world's gonna stop. And the timing was perfect for us to get to know each other on a deeper level. That time has also given birth to his wife's new book, Sis, Don't Settle. The subtitle, How to Stay Smart in Matters of the Heart. So. Did Faith have a period of being dumb in matters of the heart? She sure did. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to read all about it in the book. I know, I've read. I, I told the stories. I told the stories. And that's, that's what it's really about. I dated for, I was out in the dating streets for 15 years before I met my husband. And uh, learned a lot of things the hard way. Learned them by going through the lessons. It was trial and error because I didn't have this huge example of what love looked like in my life growing up. Wow. And uh, it was rough. And I learned a lot of things, and I, I, but I learned from them. And that was the key, learning. And I wrote about them in the book because I feel if I share some of my stories and some of my experiences, other people can learn from them too. Why another book about relationships and you I'm asking this because you sort of detailed at the start why another book, but why another book? And I, I was a person who read all the relationship books, <laughs> wow, okay. but there was no one like me writing them. I would read a lot of books about relationships from men, other women who didn't have similar experiences, and I wanted to write something that I would have wanted to read when I was single and trying to navigate life and love. So not only do I give women encouragement because I was single for a long time. I remember turning 35 
and where I'm from down in the South, you not being married at 35 is like seeing a dog walk on his hind legs. <laughs> it's very strange. And uh, so I want to encourage women who are waiting until they meet the right person, but still getting all those questions about why aren't they married. I want to encourage them, but I also Ephraim wanted to give really practical advice mm. on what to do in all of these different dating scenarios that you might encounter, because I encountered a lot of them. But I had an epiphany in the process that it wasn't about finding the right person, it was about becoming the right person. Because when you became the right person and you knew who you were, you were, very, you were smarter about making the decisions and you were faster to make the right decisions about what was right and what was wrong for you. While Kenny has mastered singing love songs, he's seen the other side and suffered through divorce. Kenny, you meet your wife and you guys become fast friends. Mm -hmm. Were you looking for love or were you been there, done that? I'm Oh, no, I was. Okay. <laughs> I, I had done the work that she's talking about. Ah. Uh, I had a period of, you know, do you like Kenny? You know, just dealing with me and where I am in my life. And am I settled? Am I whole? Am I healthy? What do I have to really offer in a relationship? Because I believe that relationships should be sacrificial. They're service. So um, that period really put me in a position where I was like, I think I'm ready to date now with some seriousness. Not just I want to go out and have some fun, or I just you know, want to hang out, whatever, but that I'm really ready for a committed relationship that, um, that I believe would bless my life and I, I would bless somebody else's. And together. Faith and Kenny have been touring the country to bless others with their story. Two key things. Know who you are, and it's not about finding the right person but being the right person. Great advice. Well, stay with us for coming up after the break, an innocent man is arrested and quickly realizes justice is not blind. Ray still remembers the arresting officer's chilling words. There's five things that are gonna convict you. Number one, you black. Number two, a white man is gonna say you shot him. Whether you shot him or not, believe me, I don't care. Your Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. Ray Hinton was sentenced to death for a crime he didn't commit. He spent nearly half his life fighting for his freedom, but getting released from prison was only half the battle. He also had to contend for his soul against anger and bitterness towards those who had falsely accused him of murder. Here's his story. Birmingham, Alabama, 1985. Police arrest Anthony Ray Hinton the man they believe committed three armed robberies that left two restaurant managers dead and a third wounded. To be accused of murder, it, to me, it, it don't get no worse than that. Anthony, or Ray, still remembers the arresting officer's chilling words. There's five things that are going to convict you. Number one, you black. Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him. Whether you shot him or not, believe me, I don't care. He said, number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, you're going to have a white judge. And number five, you're going to have an all-white jury. On parole for petty theft, the 29-year-old was living with his mom and working as a day laborer. His claims of innocence would fall on deaf ears, including those of his court-appointed lawyer. What do you do when you tell a lawyer that you're innocent and he looks at you and say, the problem with that statement, all of y'all always doing something in the moment you get caught. You say you didn't do it. What do you do with that? Despite the fact Ray had an ironclad alibi for at least one of the robberies and the lack of solid evidence, prosecutors pushed for a conviction. Their key piece of evidence, 
expert testimony claiming the ballistics report of the bullets pulled from the victims matched a handgun found in Ray's home. An all-white jury would find Ray guilty of two counts of capital murder and sentence him to death by electric chair. It's hurt so bad. Why me? What did I do? I even asked God, what did I do so bad? Ray's mother, Bueller, and his best friend, Lester Bailey, were crushed by the outcome. Your natural reaction was, it, it's over. He's going to be executed. At Holman Correctional Facility, Ray's cell was a mere 30 feet from the execution chair they called Yellow Mama. Ray would spend his time fighting not only a legal system that would block every one of his appeals, but the bitterness in his heart. The first three years, I was in a stage of hating. I hated the old men that did this to me. Ray began to realize the person he had become wasn't the one his mother had raised him to be, a man who loved God and followed the example of Jesus Christ. I asked God to remove this hatred. But in order for me to be free, I had no choice but to pray for those men that did this to me. So Ray made a decision. If this were God intend for me to be and die, this is where I die. But while I'm here, everything around me gonna live. I'm going to bring the best out of everybody that come in touch with me. One of those people was Henry Hayes, a KKK member on death row for lynching a black teenager. I truly believe God sent me to death row to meet Henry Francis Hayes and to show him what real love felt like and real love had no color. During their unlikely friendship, Ray saw God change Henry from a man full of hatred to one who knew God's love and had found redemption in Jesus Christ. Ray still remembers one of their last conversations before Henry's execution in 1997. I said, Henry, I truly believe that you are going to help. And Henry said, well, you know, Ray, I've been reading the Bible and I have changed my views on so many things. I finally looked at you as a human being. As for Ray, the courts would continue to block his appeals for a retrial. Then in 1998, the Equal Justice Initiative, or EJI, decided to take Ray's case. Among their efforts for criminal justice reform, the nonprofit provides legal aid to those who've been imprisoned unjustly. We just knew that it was just a matter of time, and we had the faith that one day it was going to be all right. EJI's probe into Ray's trial was disturbing. Among their findings, witnesses had been manipulated. Ray's defense counsel was inept, and the surviving victim's initial description of the assailant bore little resemblance to Ray. But it would be a single piece of evidence that held the key to proving Ray's innocence. EJI lawyer Charlotte Morrison explains. We hired three of the nation's best firearms experts, and they looked at the evidence and they said, this, you know, there is no match here. The only evidence that the state ever had um, claimed connected Mr. Um, Hinton did not exist. Despite the new evidence, the courts still refused to reopen Ray's case. Then another crushing setback. Ray's mother, who had visited him almost every week since his incarceration, died in 2002. I don't think the society nor the men that did this to me realized what they took from me. Then, in 2014, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear Ray's case. By unanimous vote, the court ruled to grant Ray a new trial. I've always felt that I had the supreme lawyer. I don't believe the God that I serve is going to let me die for a crime he know I didn't commit. In April 2015, the state of Alabama dismissed all charges against Ray when state ballistics experts were unable to match the bullets to the handgun. Two days later, after serving 30 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, Ray was released. Only by the grace of God. I mean, only. It was a, an overwhelming day, and it should never have taken that long. For Ray, it was a bittersweet moment. For your mom not to be here the day that you were released, to run into her arm and say, 
I'm home, Mom. It's, I try my best to be the son that she brought me up to be. Now a community educator with EJI, Ray is doing what he can to bring reform to the justice system. He's also written a book about his journey of forgiveness and redemption, hoping his story will inspire change and healing. Jesus didn't say, hey, when an enemy come across you, I want you to hate him. That ain't what he said. Love the enemy. The only way that we will ever conquer hate is love. Love your enemies. That's not an easy thing to do. However, it's necessary because hate and bitterness will destroy you. Anthony asked God to remove the hate from his heart. But to be truly free, he had to pray for the men who falsely accused him. Follow Anthony's example, and you'll find that over time, God will give you the ability to love your enemy and free your heart from hate. Stay with us because coming up after the break, a woman wonders if she's worth loving. Am I ever going to get real love? Can I fall and people really just embrace me, give me grace? us on 0300-561-0700 or visit the website at www.cbneurope.com forward slash TPI. Welcome back. Adelaide Brown was abandoned by her father. His absence made her believe she wasn't worthy of receiving love. This mindset led her into wrong relationships and bad choices. It wasn't until someone helped her discover her true value that her life changed. Here's her story. It was like, I have all of this love. You should be happy, but I'm still missing that one thing. Growing up with a loving single mom in Charleston, South Carolina, Adelaide Brown had one question burning in her mind. Where is my dad? Like, what did I do? Like, where is he? Why isn't he here? Adelaide was a toddler when her parents broke up, her father becoming at once a stranger she'd rarely hear from. And despite her best efforts to become the perfect daughter, it was never enough to earn his love and attention. Maybe if I can be happier or prettier or smarter, if I cannot mess up so much, He'll come around. I developed that conclusion that something must be inherently, like innately wrong with me. Then when Adelaide was in the sixth grade, her mom started dating an emotionally abusive man. He not only commanded her mom's attention, he led her back into drugs after she had been clean for several years. He was being manipulative, like trying to pull my mom and I apart. I just got angry. I felt rejected by her. I knew she would protect me, but I never felt safe emotionally. Adelaide's only relief was the time spent with her grandmother, a Christian who taught her to trust in Jesus as her savior. But when things didn't change at home. I knew God was a good God and a just God, but that's why I thought something was wrong with me. I am bad, and that's why God isn't helping me. By high school, Adelaide was known as the model teenager, the A student who did no wrong. But at home, life had become unbearable, and she was in a dysfunctional relationship of her own. So at 17, she moved out, and two months later, she was pregnant. I just felt like I was slipping, because I was the girl who was the all A student. You're not the girl that gets pregnant. You're a good girl. Despite the stigma and shame, Adelaide pressed on and finished high school, got a job, and began putting herself through college, all while raising her daughter and caught in an unhealthy relationship. 
but her hard work and sacrifice still didn't bring what she needed most. And deep down inside, I'm like, for what? Am I ever going to get real love? Uh, can, can I fall and people really uh, just embrace me, give me grace? Mentally, I started feeling like I can't handle this. Eventually, she broke up with her boyfriend, but the pressure she kept putting on herself was suffocating. So to let off steam, the now 21-year-old dabbled in alcohol and drugs with friends. One day, she realized it was taking her down a familiar path. I, I'm not good enough to be a mother. I'm turning into my mom. I just kind of broke down in tears, just crying, like uncontrollably. I was thinking, I'm losing my mind. I'm going to end up losing my daughter. My mind was spiraling just that fast. I was like, I'm losing it. Like, I can't get it together. And in that moment of desperation, it was like I felt this calming feeling. And I just knew Jesus, like Christ, in me, like a a voice on the inside. And it was like, it's going to be OK. And from that day on, I started pursuing him. Adelaide would spend years going to church, Bible studies, and prayer meetings, and doing all the right things, trying to get closer to God. I'm still not good enough. I'm not getting the feeling I was looking for. I'm not getting the peace. I'm not looking in the mirror and liking what I'm seeing. Finally, she began to accept that God's love wasn't something she had to earn. He started showing me, no, your, your heart is hard. I just wasn't receiving his love. He was trying to give it to me. As the walls around her heart began to crumble, Adelaide understood that through Christ, she was more than worthy of God's love. I can love myself because Christ loved me. If, if Jesus died on the cross for me, if he went through such a sacrifice for me, it's a slap in his face for me not to love me. Now an author and working in ministry, Adelaide is married to Kevin and raising four kids. She's also built strong relationships with both of her parents, and her mom has been clean since 2010. Adelaide says that seeing herself through God's eyes helped transform her life. Only Christ could have done that. We can get caught up in all of our imperfections, but he said, I'll give you beauty for ashes, but we have to receive it. And that's really my story, just receiving it. We hear this scripture all the time, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus loves you and he's so much wanting to be in a relationship with you that he freely gave his life. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He saw us on the cross. We were the joy set before him. It wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross. It was his love for you. If you don't take anything else from today's show, just know this. Jesus loves you no matter what you've done. His love is yours to receive if you'll open your heart. If you're ready to receive his love, commit your life to him. Do this with me. Pray these simple words. Say these words after me. Lord Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying the ultimate price. Thank you for inviting me into a new life. I accept your love. I accept this new life. And I confess, Jesus, that you are Lord. Amen. And Heavenly Father, I pray for my brother, my sister, who have made this confession and decided to make Jesus their number one. I ask you that whatever it is that they're grappling with, the things that are causing them to stumble, the, the things that are seem insurmountable for them, that you grant them peace right now. Let them know peace that's beyond understanding, in spite of it all, in spite of the chaos around them, let them know that you are with them. Thank you, Heavenly Father. 
Amen. If you want to know more about the salvation Jesus gives, or you'd like someone to pray with you further about a personal matter, please message us on WhatsApp. And a prayer counselor is standing by to pray with you and answer all of your questions. Now, for our viewers in the United States and in Europe, you can call using the number on your screen. Now, don't worry if you didn't get the number because during the break, you will have the information again. Now, don't go anywhere. We have so much more for you on TPI. on 0300-561-0700 or visit the website at www.cbneurope.com forward slash TPI. Welcome back. I want to invite you to be a part of the TPI family. Hit the subscribe button on our website and you'll receive a free monthly update on all things TPI and also a 30-day devotional based on our Inspire Minute segment. Now, while you're on the website, would you consider becoming a monthly financial partner? Click on the donate button at the top of the screen and follow the prompts. Your gift ensures that we continue to produce quality Christian programming for the next 25 years. Well, we've come to the end of the show, but I have one final thought that I want to share with you. It's a quote from the theologian and writer, St. Augustine, and it's this. God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. Amen. From all of us here at TPI, goodbye and God bless you. Call